This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Is Dr. Miranda Kaufman. She studied history at the Christ Church, Oxford, where she completed her doctoral thesis on Africans in Britain between 1500 and 1640 in 2011. As a freelance historian and journalist, she has worked for the Sunday Times, BBC, the National Trust, English Heritage, the Oxford Companion Series. She's a popular speaker at conferences, seminars in schools, from Hull to Jamaica, and has published articles in academic journals and elsewhere, including the Times Literary Supplement, the Times, the Guardian, History Today, BBC History Magazine, and Periscope Post. The work she's about to present this evening will be available in her new publication, Black Tudors 2017. <coughs> Please put your hands together for Miranda. Thank you so much, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak here tonight. It's a real honour and delighted to, to share some of my research with you. Um, so, we've been stuck in the 20th century so far, far tonight, um, and so I'm gonna, we're going to travel backwards in time. I've heard this, you know, we started in 1914 and we went to 1900, and now we're going to shoot back 400 years to uh, the Tudor period and our time machine. So, uh, until very recently, the Tudor period has been a gap in our knowledge of black British history. Uh, it's been a massively under-researched area. As late as 1999, um, a, a history professor at Liverpool called Paul Hare wrote that black Africans were hardly at all known in England at this time. Um, Peter Cryer's staying power that we've already mentioned tonight only devoted a few pages to the period, um, and he listed 17 individuals living in Tudor of England. When I began my research in 2004, Marika was kind enough to share the references that she and Vassar had by then accumulated, mostly from parish registers, uh, and they knew of, at that point, less than 100 individuals. Um, but since then, two whole books have been written um, devoted to the subject, and I'm in the process of writing a third. We need more. Um, so I found evidence uh, of over 360 individuals over the Tudor and early Stuart period from 1500 to 1640, around 200 of those uh, from the Tudor period, so that's 1485 to 1603. And I found them across the country, everywhere from Hull to Truro, um, and there were, as you would imagine, uh, larger numbers in port towns, uh, London of course, but also Plymouth, Southampton and Bristol. But you also find them in remote rural villages like Lundersham cum Eric. I had to look that one up, obviously. Anyway, <laughs> there you are. And, and this is an example of a parish register. You can see Sligo and uh, buried there in December 1594. And there are just many of these across the country in parish registers that you find in the local, your local archives. So it's always worth going in and having a look, as we said. <clears throat> Uh, but most people, including politicians, do not know this history, and this affects the way they think about modern immigration. So I've brought loads of pretty pictures. This is one of the yeah. Anyway, uh, meanwhile, slavery continues to dominate popular perceptions of black history. The reason Tudor black history is worth looking at, particularly, is that it challenges these narratives. The presence of Africans as early as 1501 shows that immigration is nothing new. While the free status of Africans in this period <coughs> demonstrates that black people have not always been enslaved by the English. So now I'd like to tell you a bit more about this little known area of black history. How did Africans arrive in England? Well, not as a result of English slave trading. As you can see from this graph, uh, there was not a lot of English slave trading going on in the Tudor period. Um, these, this, if you can see, see here, there's a little uh, and that is, uh, represents the activities of the infamous John Hawkins. Uh, you can see what he was up to by his coat of arms, really. Uh, and in the 1560s, um, he conducted three personally and sponsored a fourth voyage um, from Plymouth, um, a, a slaving voyage he was set out from Plymouth, um, collected Africans on the coast of Africa and took them. But he took them to the Spanish Caribbean to sell. Um, because there were, at this point, no English colonies in the New World, 
and, and so the market that there was there was, was <coughs> within the Spanish community. And so he was actually an interloper. The Spanish had already been trading as though it was quite but Hawkins is an interloper into that world. And the Spanish actually are not very happy to have an English merchant uh, getting involved. And they showed him how they felt at San Juan de Lure off the coast of Mexico in 1568, when the Spanish caught up with him and decimated his fleet uh, to the point that he had to abandon 100 of his men on the coast there because he didn't have the wherewithal to uh, support them on the way back across the Atlantic. And actually, this disaster put paid to any further, I mean, put, put paid to any further attempts uh, at English slave trading until 1641. So if it wasn't um, English slave trading, then how did Africans arrive in England at this time? Well, I found three main routes. Uh, firstly, they, they could come here via Europe. There was a gro growing numbers of Africans, both enslaved and free, living in Southern Europe from the 15th century onwards. By 1550, Africans made up 10% of the population of Lisbon and 7.5% of the population of Seville. As you can see from this painting uh, of the King's Fountain in the Alfama district of Lisbon in around 1570 to 1580. If you look across this sort of crowd scene, there are so many black faces in the crowd and they're uh, in a really wide range of roles in that scene as well. Some of them are uh, servants or, or enslaved people carrying water, all the red spots, the sort of red jug, water jugs, and they're, they're carrying water to their master's homes. But we also see Africans uh, in the top, in the bottom right, that there are two um, well dressed men walking to the right, and the man on horseback is actually identified as um, uh, the, a, a member of the Order of Santiago, which was a prestigious uh, religious order in that time. So they're, they're kind of suffused in all different levels of, of, of Portuguese society there. So when um, royals, aristocrats, or merchants came to England from Europe, they sometimes brought Africans with them. And you'll see, as I go on, a few, a few people who came here from Southern Europe. We also find Africans coming here directly from Africa. From the 1550s, the English start trading to Morocco and Guinea, and as the century progresses, they move further and further down the coast. Um, in 1555, um, or as it was seen at the time. Um, in 1555, this is an account of the voyage of, of John Locke. John Locke, a uh, merchant, brought five Africans from Sharma in modern-day Ghana to London. They were described as tall and strong men who could well agree with our meats and drinks, although the cold and moist air does somewhat offend them. I know how they feel. Uh, they presumably stayed at Locke's London house, where According to another merchant, they were well used and they were taught to speak English so that they could act as interpreters and facilitate trade. William Towson, another merchant, took three of them, including one named George, home in 1556. Their family and friends wept with joy to see them. The other two, Anthony and Vinnie, returned the next year. Towson goes on to record how helpful George in particular was in facilitating trade, not just on this voyage, but for many years afterwards. And this is all recorded in, in Hapfoot's um, accounts of the voyages. Then this was one of various examples of Africans coming to London for a limited period, learning English and returning home to act as interpreters and factors. A completely different uh, way in which Africans were coming here at this point uh, was as ambassadors. So this is the Moroccan ambassador who visited the court of Elizabeth I in 1600. And he was actually one of a series of such ambassadors um, uh, envoys came here from Morocco in 1551 and 1589 as well. Uh, the idea was to ally against Spain, which was the mutual enemy sort of in between England and, and Morocco. Uh, and there were some efforts to do so, but it never really amounted to much and didn't really do much. But it was a nice, it was a nice idea. <coughs> um, and um, Africans also thirdly came here via the Atlantic and Caribbean world. Um, the Spanish and Portuguese had transported over 300,000 Africans across the Atlantic uh, between 1516 and 1619. There's uh, a contemporary uh, drawing of some of them working in a, in a Spanish silver mine in, in uh, South America. Um, although not, not all Africans in South America were enslaved, uh, some of them have managed to run away from their Spanish masters and create their own um, communities in the hinterland. These, these three men are chieftains of one of those maroon, um, as they were called, maroon um, groups. And so when, uh, when English
fishermen captured Spanish ships uh, or, ra or raided Spanish Caribbean ports, they would encounter Africans. Uh, so here's an example, you might have heard of Marcus Gray, but he's wearing a very interesting uh, jewel around his waist there in that portrait. Uh, that is the, the Drake jewel, uh, which is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. It was a present to Drake from Queen Elizabeth. That's the outside. If you open it up, there's a miniature of the Queen. Um, but obviously there's this image at the front that's particularly intriguing. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as historians are want to do, they disagree about the significance of this image. But the argument that I like the best, and I'm going to tell you now, is uh, one, one historian has commented that perhaps this image is an image of a military alliance between Africans and Englishmen. Because in 1573, when Drake was raiding the Spanish Caribbean, he was put into contact by a man called Diego, who we think was one of these maroons, or was an, a runaway slave who was somewhere in between the pa Panama and, and the maroon community, uh, with, with the local maroons in Panama. And uh, a, a party of 30 maroons and 17 English, so it was very much a maroon-led expedition. You know, Drake's biographers like to put it the other way around, but actually, some Englishmen tagged along with the Maroons, and between them, they successfully captured over 150,000 pesos of Spanish silver and gold in Panama. So that, that's Panama, and you can see that it's a very narrow strip of land. So the Spanish used to get their silver down in Peru and then ship it up to Panama, uh, and then march it across the, the isthmus and put it on another set of a fleet, um, which would then take them back to Spain. So during that little land crossing across the isthmus, uh, the treasure was actually very vulnerable to attack, and the Maroons had been attacking it for some years by the time Drake got there, but he got lucky and, and hooked up with them, and they, they brought all this treasure back to England that sort of made his name to start with. And we know that one of these Maroons, uh, Diego, returned to Plymouth with Drake in August 1573, living there for four years before joining Drake on his circumnavigation of the globe in 1577. Unfortunately, he, he died on the voyage somewhere in Indonesia, but that's another story. Um, I want to say something about um, slavery. I think it's, it's all too easy to assume that all Africans in Europe at this time were enslaved. We're bombarded with images of enslaved Africans, often dating to later periods or other countries, most recently in the film 12 Years a Slave. But we need to think of, of these images alongside these ones. Uh, and, and this one, same actor, different clothes. Uh, and bear in mind uh, these images of Africans in early modern Europe. Uh, he was Duke of Florence. We don't know who they were yet. But more research needs to be done. And he was an ambassador to, to the Dutch court in, 50, in the 1640s. Um, and so looking at those images and thinking about different, uh, different ideas, we can consider that people at the time made other assumptions. For example, in 1572, an English sailor named William Collins, one of those left behind in Mexico after Hawkins' third voyage, <coughs> reported um, a conversation he'd had with an enslaved African named Juan Galop, who was working in Mexico. And uh, Juan Galof, and we think from his surname that he may have been a Wolof, uh, Juan Galof uh, told William Collins that England must be a good country as there were no slaves there. And Collins replied, it was true, they were all free men in England. And uh, Collins was right, uh, there was no law of slavery in England at this time. As William Harrison explained in his description of England in 1587, such is the privilege of our country if any come hither from other realms, so soon as they set foot on land, they become as free in condition as their masters. The only known court case uh, in 1569, the only known court case in this period to explicitly consider the issue of slavery, resolved that England has too pure an air for slaves to breathe in. That all sounds very nice, but it could have been the English just bigging themselves up. And, you know, and we know what they were up to later, and Hawkins, you know, it's a bit contradictory with what Hawkins was up to in the 1560s, but there seemed to be one rule abroad and one rule at home. But, and, and in practice, we, we have Africans reporting becoming free in England. So in 1490, an African called Pero Alvarez 
told the King of Portugal that he had been set free by Henry VII of England while he was in England. And he's back in Portugal and he's telling this to the King of Portugal and the King of Portugal you know, take, uh, takes that and says, okay, so you're, you're free and he's allowed to continue being a free man in Portugal. And over a century later, Diogo, an African who was taken to England by an English pirate in 1614, reported to the Portuguese Inquisition that when he laid foot on English soil, he immediately became free because in that reign, nobody was a slave. A further sign of free status in English society was that Africans were allowed to testify in court. This was a privilege of free men. Enslaved people were not allowed to testify in Roman times or in colonial America. There were a few examples of African men appearing as witnesses in English courts. The earliest we know of was Jack Francis, as you said at the beginning of his testimony. He was um, a salvage diver who had been part of a team of divers who brought up guns from the wreck of the Mary Rose. Um, his skills were really special in a time, you know, most Englishmen didn't know how to swim, but, but Africans did know how to swim, and they had to, uh, the Englishmen had to rely on that skill uh, to, to get back these valuable guns from the wreck of the Mary Rose. And um, there were other, the, the team was working on other wrecks as well at the time. And in 1548, <coughs> Jack Francis had to testify in support of his Venetian master, Piero Paolo Corsi, I say master in terms of servant and master rather than slave and master. But anyway, uh, Corsi uh, was ac accused of stealing, and uh, Jack Francis testified, uh, it specified it here, in, uh, of his own free will. However, one of the other witnesses in the case, Anthony de Nicola Romero of, Ve of Venice, and actually two other Italian merchants, um, complained that Jack Francis is actually a slave. Uh, Romero says that the said James Francis is a Morisco born where they are not christened, and slave to the said Peter Paolo. And therefore, he believeth that no credit nor faith ought to be given to his sayings, as in other strange Christian countries, it is no such slave given. However, Jack asserts, um, according to uh, John Tira, the court interpreter, he, he asserts in his evidence that he is famulus, such as this word here. Latin. He says, I'm a famulus, uh, that bit is the beginning of Latin. He says, I'm famulus, of course, not a servant. Is a slave. Spamulus is an interesting word. Uh, it means a servant or attendant rather than a slave. And that it was used this way in 16th century English courts is proven by the fact that mariners John Tuns and Humphrey Bonds were both described as famulus to John Hawkins when they gave evidence in a case of 1568. So although Jax is being perceived as a slave by the Italians, his self-description as a servant was accepted by the court and his evidence was taken. Africans were also paid wages for their work or became financially independent. This is the royal trumpeter John Blank, which is in the middle of the second row there. And this is the only known portrait of an African in 16th century England. And we see him here performing in the Westminster Tournament of 1511, which Henry VIII put on to celebrate <coughs> the birth of their son uh, to him and Catherine of Aragon. And this son actually died sort of 10, 10 days after the tournament, which is why probably never heard of him. This, this image is part of a 60-foot long uh, record of the, of the event. Uh, that's the central scene of showing Henry VIII uh, knocking another man off his horse, although that didn't actually happen. So that's the, uh, the <laughs> tube of spin for you. Uh, and you can see the queen and her ladies watching. So it was a really spectacular event, but I think this modern painting really brings it to life a bit better. The excitement there, and th in this image, you can see John Blank is included on the right uh, with the blue face. Uh, and um, this this is, image is actually on display permanently in the Tower Hill underpass, along with many other images by the same artist, Trafrigan Tudor History Club. So, if you, the next time you walk under there, look out for John Blank. Um, but we know John Blank was being paid wages because uh, records of those wages exist in, in the Royal Exchequer accounts. And this is just one of various entries showing that he's being paid. And this one, he's getting his rate of eight pence a day, uh, which reflects an annual salary of 12 pounds. And this actually doubled under, the, that was in the reign of Henry VII. This doubled in the reign of Henry VIII after uh, Blank wrote this persuasive petition. Uh, in, this, in this petition, he actually 
he said, oh, well, one of the, your other trumpeters has died recently, so can I have his money as well? Because the money I'm getting at the moment isn't enough to maintain me in the style to which I'd like to become accustomed. No, he says, I'm not, I'm, you know, I need more money so that I can serve you better. You know, and I intend to serve you for the rest of my life, and I will daily pray for the continuance of your reign. So it's one of those letters. But anyway, it seems to work, because on the top left, you can see the king's scroll. And the other really clever thing about this petition is it says, and let you know, your signature show that this is enough, you know, a good enough warrant for the pay. You know, it's like you don't have to produce any more pieces of paper. All you have to do is sign here, and it's all good, and I'll get my money. So it's very, very clever. I don't know if that was his ideas or the guy who wrote it for him, but it was, it's a good idea. Um, <clears throat> so, so he's getting paid uh, double under Henry, and actually at the Westminster tournament where you saw him, he's actually he and all the other trumpeters are getting paid ten times the back day rate. So, and there are other examples as well of Africans earning wages, but there's also evidence of Africans earning an independent living. So, as craftsmen, for example, in 1540, we find. Um, a needle maker is inside, <coughs> which is this big shopping trolley, which runs east from St Paul's towards the Bank of England. John Stowe, the, the, the writer here, added that this needle maker would never teach his art to any. So he has a monopoly because um, these Spanish needles are needles made of steel, and the English had previously made needles from bone, ivory, or wood. So it's a completely new technology that he's brought in from Spain, and so he can charge whatever he likes for it. And nobody else was doing this until the, uh, the reign of Elizabeth, so um, you know, 10, 10, 20 years later. So he, he, he was making an okay money out of that. And we also find a reasonable black man, that's his name, according to the parish registers, a silk weaver in 1590 Southwark. Uh, and his three children were baptized in, in this church, St. Olive's, Tudor Street, between 1587 and 1592. Some African men even had enough money to be able to vi visit to afford to visit London's prostitutes. This is a, uh, <coughs> a, one of various records from the Bridewell Court. And we find that um, Anthony of Blackmore was taken a bed together with Jane Thompson, the door locked to them. She, she's the one who gets punished. But, um, so we, that's an interesting indicator that he was able to afford that. Um, I also found um, the, the, and in another, another thing that showed, uh, was interesting is uh, the, Chris, the Christian status of Africans in, in Tudorism. I found evidence of 66 baptisms of Africans in Britain between 1500 and 1640, not to mention the burials, marriages, and court appearances that would also have required baptism. Um, and Africans also married, uh, which not only required Christian status, but further suggests that Catholics <coughs> into the parish community. John Blank, uh, the trumpeter got married in 1512, and we know this because the king gave them a wedding present. In this warrant of 1512, January 14, 1512, uh, Henry VIII um, asks the great wardrobe to deliver to John Blank a gown of violet cloth, a bonnet, and a hat to be taken of our gift against his marriage. Uh, a, uh, a writer called George Best reported that in 1578, I myself have seen an Ethiopian as black as coal brought to England, who, taking a fair English woman to wife, begat a son in all respects as black as his father. Parish registers provide further examples. So this is the marriage um, record here of John the Coney, who married the widow um, Paranel May in January 1603 in Kilhaddon in Hertfordshire. And we also, there are also examples of African women marrying black, uh, English men. So in 1600, Joan Maria, a blackamoor of the parish of St. Philip and St. Jacob Bristol, was described as now the wife of Thomas Smith, a man who made bills which were a kind of weapon. And had a sermon been preached on their wedding day, the text might have been Numbers 12.1, in which the King James's Bible told that Moses had married an Ethiopian woman. So, in conclusion, there were, there were hundreds of Africans in Tudor England. Contrary to the stereotype, in this period of British history, Africans were not enslaved in England, but instead found paid employment and were able to marry and testify in court. One day, I hope you will have a more inclusive and therefore accurate understanding of British history when we know about Henry VIII's black trumpeter as well as his six wives, 
when we know about the African diver who salvaged guns from the Mary Rose, and when we know there were Africans aboard Francis Drake's circumnavigation voyage. Until then, we need to continue filling the gaps in Black British history and sharing what we've found to show that Black history isn't just about Mary Seacole or the Windrush, but is in fact a vital and continuous part of this country's history. Thank you so much for listening.